So now coming to the final part of the session, which is the last lecture, last part of this entire thing, which is hypothesis testing. So now John is, so we have understood about all of this time about confidence intervals and this whole concept of what is the understanding interpretation of 95% confidence interval. So now John is kind of considered about this, he's curious and he's interested in dissecting the real estate scene in Old Town. He's interested in seeing whether the prices of houses are different on an average when compared to rest of the plane. So he has this hypothesis that prices of houses in Old Town are different from prices of houses in Brooklyn, right? So this is the hypothesis he has. So this is what he has conjured up is basically called hypothesis and a hypothesis testing is basically this whole concept of, so first let's talk about hypothesis, then we talk about hypothesis testing. So hypothesis is basically a statement which might be true, which can be tested. Uh, for example, Sam has a hypothesis that large dogs are better at catching tennis balls than small dogs which can test that hypothesis by having hundreds of different sized dogs trying to catch different tennis balls, right? So the beauty of hypothesis is it can be tested. So only those opinions, right? Only those facts which can be tested are actually called hypothesis. If you say that uh, life does exist after death, I really don't think you can call that a hypothesis because the underlying understanding is you cannot do multiple experiments to kind of confirm that truth, right? So as of now, uh, that's about hypothesis. Hypothesis testing is basically hypothesis is anything that is a statement that you have as, as a as an opinion. You really do not have a statistical data backing behind it. You just think that is something that might be true. If, for example, in this case, uh, John thought that prices in Old Town would be probably be same as prices of a house in other parts of the city, right? So that is an opinion. And obviously, as with all opinion, they should be checked for facts. And that's exactly the concept of hypothesis testing, right? So hypothesis testing is the statistical hypothesis test based on a statement called the null hypothesis that assumes that nothing interesting is going on happening, whatever variables you're trying to testing. So anything that you're trying, the opinion that you have is basically the counter of the, the counter of your opinion, right? So which basically says that he says, so your opinion is that um, prices are probably different. So your null hypothesis should be your prices are same, right? And uh, so anything which basically opposes your opinion is your null hypothesis, right? And therefore, in John's case, the John case, John's case, the null hypothesis is that mean of. So John assumes that the prices are different. His hypothesis is that prices in Old Town are different from prices in Brooklyn. So his mean, null hypothesis is something that goes against it, which is that mean of house prices in Old Town is not different from houses all over Brooklyn, right? So that is his null hypothesis. So why null hypothesis is the purpose of a hypothesis test is to determine whether the null hypothesis is likely to be given true. So what you want to first test is the opposite of what you actually feel is true, right? So whatever is your opinion, you basically compose a counter of it. That is your null hypothesis. And your first part of your, your major, your entire statistical test is basically based on the idea whether you can kind of do you have enough evidence to kind of reject your null hypothesis, right? So you, na, purpose of hypothesis test is to determine whether the null hypothesis is likely to be true given the sample data. If there is little evidence against the null hypothesis given the data, you accept the null hypothesis. If the null hypothesis is unlikely, right? So if, if the data says that, hey, I think the null hypothesis that you're assuming is probably not wrong, is not correct, then you have to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. That something interesting is going on. So alternative hypothesis is nothing but the question that you ask which kind of opposes the null hypothesis, right? So which is basically the, your opinion in the first place. The idea that you had in the first place is your alternative hypothesis. And therefore in John's case, the alternative hypothesis mean of houses in Old Town is different from the houses all over Brooklyn. Out of this, obviously one hypothesis can be correct. It could be either null hypothesis or alternative hypothesis, right? So in hypothesis testing, we test a sample with the goal of accepting or rejecting a null hypothesis, which is our assumption or default position. The test tells us whether or not our primary hypothesis is true, right? So the tests are basically aimed at checking for null hypothesis. If you have enough evidence that supports your null hypothesis, you accept your null hypothesis. If your null hypothesis, if you do not have enough evidence for your null hypothesis, you kind of reject it. So the null hypothesis is assumed to be true and statistical evidence is required to reject it in favor of research of an alternative hypothesis, right? So we required, 
so the idea is that you have a null hypothesis you cannot really reject it until and unless you have found strong evidence against it right so now what is really this word strong right so there's a strong evidence that i said suddenly so we require a standard on the available evidence to reject the null hypothesis or not right so if we lay so we have to reject the null hypothesis right so that's that's only when we can have actually accept alternative hypothesis understand this alternative hypothesis is the thing that i think is actually true but i cannot directly accept it right so for me to accept this i have to first prove disprove the null hypothesis which is the opposite of what i think and to disprove that i need enough evidence right and enough strong evidence so what do we need by strong so we basically require a standard based on the available evidence to reject the null hypothesis right so assume the null hypothesis is a convict in a jail kind of a scenario in a court trial kind of a scenario something so if we set a low standard right if we say that hey i can i think even if it's if it's, if it's if we can reject null hypothesis even we do not have enough strong evidence what will happen is that we would increase the number of percentage of innocent people convicted right however we would also increase the percentage of guilty people convicted which is fair enough right if we have a low standard which is basically we are not like looking for very strong evidence to convict someone we would end up convicting a lot of people right like we would end up convicting a lot of innocent people we would also probably end up convicting a lot of guilty people whereas if we say a high standard and we said we need extremely strong evidence strong evidence to kind of convict someone then what will happen is we'll increase the percentage of innocent people let free which is basically we will not in, in we will not kind of uh convict a lot of innocent people but the problem is that we will also probably not convict a lot of guilty people right so that's the problem that we are basically having right so that's why we need to kind of also when saying that we need evidence we also need to decide at what is the amount of evidence that we want to look at so now let's come back to maths behind hypothesis testing so once you have the null and the alternative hypothesis in hand you choose a significance level right which is basically the standard the significance levels basically say that hey the significance level is basically a probability threshold that determines when you reject the null hypothesis and so if you're if you're basically at what what confidence do you have in your null hypothesis right so it could be a 95% it could be a 99% it could be a 90% again the same thing right so at what confidence do you want to reject your null so if you have 99% confidence obviously that means you require a lot of evidence to kind of uh reject your null hypothesis right so for example if you read just need 90% then probably you have a low standard right so that's the idea so significance level is basically you define what is the amount of so this is basically denoted by the greek letter alpha right so alpha basically says what is the what is the what is the confidence which you want to add, which you want to do the test there is something as a user you have to choose right you can choose a 95% confidence interval test you can choose a 97 99% 90% whatever you want to do uh, and how do we actually do this so we basically calculate so how do we do this whole hypothesis testing bit so for every hypothesis testing the process is simple so you first state your what is a null hypothesis then you state your alternative hypothesis that is true after that what you do is basically you calculate your test statistic so test statistic is something that you based on the observation the samples number so you would basically do a lot of samples right so based on say one sample that you have picked up you calculate something right you calculate your test statistic and then you see whether this test statistic is above a significance level or not if this test statistic is basically say this if your test statistic is for example 1 point we saw the z critical values for our normal distributions at 95% confidence sorry 95% confidence interval was 1.96 plus minus 1.96 right so basically that would mean that if we are doing a statistic test statistic which basically comes out to be less than 1.96 we can say that hey that's that's within the prob this is within the significance value right so then probably we can say that hey we can we cannot reject the null hypothesis whereas if the z value comes out to be say uh, greater than 0.96 right in case we are doing a 95% confidence interval test then we can say that the z score is actually very high we really cannot we can really cannot accept the null hypothesis we have to reject the null hypothesis right so that's the that's the idea so instead of normal distribution we will be talking about lot of other distributions and that's the only thing that kind of changes uh, whether we do it for continuous variable whether we do it for discrete variable the kind of distribution that we use but the idea is simple based on the sample that you observe you calculate a test statistic the test statistic could be z score the test statistic could be something else also we'll talk about all of this in a while but you calculate the test statistic and then you see if it is kind of 
below your significance level or above your significance level and then based on that you decide whether to accept null hypothesis or to reject null hypothesis so after carrying out a test your probability of getting up so what you're actually trying to do while you are testing this so what you're trying to do is after carrying out a test so when you're taking a sample and you're carrying out something right some kind of test statistic and checking for significance level what you're basically checking is that uh, what is the probability of getting a result as, as extreme as the one you have observed due to chance is lower than significance level you reject the null hypothesis right so if you see that your probability of your getting the result that you're actually getting right based say if a sample mean says that mean of old town is greater than mean of new york right mean of old town prices in old town is basically greater than prices in brooklyn so now that is something how what is the probability that that kind of a result you would as extreme result like that you would basically obtain in if you do multiple tests right so if that is what you're trying to measure by doing your test statistic and checking about significance level or not right so if you're if you're carrying out a test and the probability of getting a result as extreme as the one you observe is due to due to chances lower than significance level right so basically the probability of such an event happening is extremely low right then you say that hey i think we cannot accept the null hypothesis we have to reject the null hypothesis right so first you based on the based on your null hypothesis you basically check for the value of the test statistic and then you see that what is the probability of this test statistic being you know uh, so extreme that one the way that you're observing it and based on that you would basically say that if the probability of that result that you see right so if you say test statistics if your uh, population mean is 200 right and you're saying something is like say 205 now is 205 is highly significant than highly different from 200 right so to determine that you would basically con con conduct the test and if the probability of such a result happening is extremely low then you say hey, we have to reject the null hypothesis if not you if you if you see the probability of such a result is uh, the probability of such a value is extremely high right if the uh, probability of such a seeing a result is extreme or more extreme than the one observed so if the on the other hand if the probability of such an event x as extreme is uh, the one that you're having is actually above significance level then only you say that hey we can accept the null hypothesis right so that's fairly easy to understand right so this probability of seeing a result as extreme as the one that you're observing in your sample right your sample is basically one part taken out from the population based on that you're trying to estimate things about the population now when you're trying to estimate that if your sample the one that you have chosen what is the extreme that that sample is an extreme extreme sample right it's, it's a very very extreme sample if the probability of that sample being an extreme sample is less than your significance level that's when you say hey i think we have to reject null hypothesis whereas if the probability of that sample being extreme is actually higher than significance level you say that hey i think we can accept that null hypothesis so this is the this is this probability that you see right the probability of that result being as extreme as the one you observe is called p values right so p value is basically it's it is it's a very commonly used um, methodology and terminology in research papers and for any matter where you're trying to check significance levels right so this is something that you would always say so significance levels and p values so p values basically say that how significant is the result that you're obtaining right so it, it, what is the significance of the result that you have obtained is it is it extremely significant or is it insignificant right so if you have a p-value which is extremely high right so that would basically mean that the probability of the event that you have observed is basically extremely high so now let's go into understanding the interpretation of p-value so p-value is really not as complicated as people make it sound and p-value is something that you would normally see in most of the research methodologies research papers p-value and significance and especially this terminology p less than 0 0.05 which is a significant p-value and p less than this is this by the way this significance is different from the significance level we have talked about so basically p less than 0 0.05 basically means that the null hypothesis has to be rejected because the values are extreme right a p value less than 0 0.05 means that the the probability of the sample that you're looking at uh, probability of that sample being a random sample is a is, is a very very highly unlikely right so you have got to reject the null hypothesis whereas if your probability p value is greater than 0 0.05 or as in whatever significance level you want to choose uh, 
Zero point zero five is just one idea. You can have any significance level, but whatever. If your p value is greater than that, you just say that. Hey, I think uh, if p value is really high, then we cannot reject the null hypothesis. We have got to accept the null hypothesis. So now, let's say we consider that significance value is basically zero point zero five, right? So this means that if we see p value of less than zero point zero five, we reject our null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis to be true because. P less than zero point zero five means that the sample that we are dealing with is an extreme sample, right? That's that's not something that is likely to be. So the, that definitely means that uh, we have to reject our null hypothesis, right? Uh, on the other hand, what you have to understand is the data from your null hypothesis follows a distribution. Uh, for example, normally distributed. Just imagine one bell bell curve for the null hypothesis. Now imagine another bell curve for hypothetically, which de defines your alternative hypothesis. So this is your null hypothesis that you see here, the black one, and then this is the alternative hypothesis, right? So what p-value is actually, right? So obviously one interpretation of p-value is this that p-value basically says that how extreme your sample is, right? Uh, given the kind of data that is based on the data, if your how extreme the sample is. The other way to interpret is assume these two distributions as null and alternate. And your alternate. What is the probability that you can find your alternate hypothesis in the null hypothesis, in the data of null hypothesis, right? So what the p-value says is the probability of finding the alternative hypothesis data in null hypothesis data, right? So understand this. So you say, uh, say I don't know. Probably you have a hypothesis which says that uh, I don't know. Give me some hypothesis. Uh, Okay, let's go with John's hypothesis. So prices in New York is same as prices in Brooklyn, right? So prices in New York is same as prices in Brooklyn. Now, obviously, if you take a lot of samples, you can see that for yourself, right? If prices in houses are actually indeed same to prices in Brooklyn, but you do not have that much of data. So what you do is take a sample of houses in New York, you take a sample of houses in Brooklyn, and you compute this, right? But the problem with that is if you compute this. Uh, what is the probability that if say now they come out to be equal, right? And then what you are trying to check is what is the probability that this sample that we chose was absolutely like you know very 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 uh, unlikely, and say, same goes for the sample that we chose for Brooklyn, right? If the probability of choosing such a sample is extremely unlikely, then we say that hey, even though are equal, but you know probability of selecting the sample is highly unlikely. We cannot really accept the null hypothesis, right? So that's the concept behind null hypothesis. So that's the exact same thing which you would understand when you're trying to do the same thing. So your alternative hypothesis. So this basically says that your alternative hypothesis was probably true, which is that prices in Brooklyn were not equal to prices in New York. And what happened was basically you found the data for your alternative hypothesis. So the data that corresponds samples which probably would have kind of supported your argument. What is the probability of finding those samples in your null hypothesis, right? So samples which support your null hypothesis, but are actually, but if you probably look at a bigger number of samples, you would say that yeah, probably alternative hypothesis is true, right? So basically, the extremity of samples. That's the exact interpretation. That's the same thing that you're trying to see here. So your p-value is basically just telling you that hey, I think prices of Brooklyn. So you and I'm kind of going back over the example once again so that we are all very clear about what p-value is. Prices in New York, prices in Brooklyn. You want to say that they are equal, right? And you actually, uh, you want to basically alternative hypothesis is they're different. Null hypothesis is they are equal. Now you take a sample from prices in Brooklyn. You pray take up prices from some other place, right? Say Old Town. So okay, again, just to kind of be sure, we are all talking the same language because I am not. So prices in Old Town is same as prices in New York. Prices in Brooklyn. Prices in Old Town same as prices in Brooklyn. Prices in Old Town is different from prices in Brooklyn, right? Now you take a sample of houses in Old Town. Now you take a sample of houses in Brooklyn, and they come out to be equal, right? Now, based on that, can you say that prices in houses, uh, prices of houses are, uh, you know, prices of houses in Brooklyn are equal to prices of houses in New York? Probably not, because if you see that the sample that you have chosen are very unlikely samples, right? Based on the data that you have. If you see that the yeah the samples are really not the most uh, robust samples that you have chosen, and there's a very unlikely chance that the data that you have chosen is actually a wrong sample. 
a probability of such a sample being selected is extremely low that's when you should say hey i cannot probably even though they're equal i have to reject null hypothesis because the probability of such a sample coming out to be is extremely low right so that's why you would go for alternative hypothesis now this whole idea of whether they're how how improbable is this sample that you have selected right how low probability is this concept of p-value so that's the same concept that we have talked about that the p-value is basically the understanding of p-value is this that what is a if you if you can find data that supports what is the probability of data that supports your alternative hypothesis in the data for null hypothesis right so that is the probability that you calculate out as p-value right so what is the probability of the samples uh, even though they are equal for example in the case that we discussed what is the probability that they were actually random extreme samples right and because of they were extreme samples they actually came out to be equal but in real life hey that would not hold right so that's that's the understanding that we have from p-values so now we actually have to calculate p-value let's do this with this example so a company uses a semi-automatic process to fill a coffee powder in 200 gram jars and this fill is known to have a standard deviation of 4 gram right so this is coffee powder that you're trying to fill in 200 gram jars and the standard deviation is 4 grams so roughly 200 and there's a deviation of 4 grams right for long the amount of coffee powder filled is observed to be normally distributed with a mean of 200 grams fair enough the manager is concerned that ensuring this process is working satisfactorily or not so that the average amount of coffee in powder filled is 200 gram or not right so that so the manager of this coffee factory is kind of concerned whether uh, the jars are actually filled with 200 grams or not so she currently takes a sample of 25 jars to do that what she does is simple she takes 25 jars weighs the amount of coffee in each of them and finds out that the average amount is equal to 202 gram well that's something that is concerning right so it's not exactly 200 gram now her problem is to how this difference of 2 gram is to be interpreted right so is this 25 samples that he has, has that she has chosen is it an extreme sample right so that's that's what it, this 2 gram difference is kind of telling right if this 2 gram difference is kind of telling that hey there's not lot much of a difference and the sample seems like from regular samples then you have to accept null hypothesis right for on the other hand if this says that hey the 2 gram difference is a significant difference right and those two grams that means your 25 samples that you have chosen are probably are extreme samples right then you have to reject your null hypothesis right so those 25 samples that you have chosen are like absolutely very unlikely to be chosen hence you have got to reject it right so null hypothesis is that mu is equal to 200 gram which is the 200 gram is your population mean right so you say that your population mean is 200 grams the alternative hypothesis is mu is not equal to 200 grams right so we know that population mean is 200 gram population standard deviation is 4 grams uh, sample mean in this case is 202 and sample size is 25 right so based on that so you're basically what you're trying to see is that uh, based on standard deviation in population was supposed to be 4 and in this particular case I see that the popular average mean is basically somewhere around 25 how reliable is the statistical test how, how reliable is the sampling that i've done that's what you're trying to at the end of the day you're concerned about right how reliable is the sample i've taken 202 obviously i see 202 is greater than 200 but can from that can i statistically reliably infer that it's 202 is greater than 200 means that for all the coffee jars in my manufacturing company are all of them greater than 200 or some of them are actually less than 200 or you know or probably most of them are equal to 200 right so that's your that's your point of concern right how statistically reliable is this sample that you have chosen right based on the idea that you know that 200 is your average supposed to be average and 4 is your standard deviation 4 gram right so based on that is 202 gram allowed like 202 gram is like within this or uh you know probably so what is your logical understanding logical understanding says this that hey 200 gram is probably your average mean and 4 gram is your standard deviation so probably this is fine right 202 gram is not significant deviation right given that 4 gram is a standard deviation from mean so 2 gram is not a very big difference so probably what this lady is observing is perfectly fine so the samples that he has she has selected 
are probably decently enough to kind of go ahead with right so there's nothing wrong with the sample so probably we can accept the null hypothesis so that's your that's your logical understanding without doing the test right you kind of know that right so 2 gram is allowable given the standard deviation is 4 gram but the understanding is also to be noted is that is 4 gram allowed within like 25 in the in a sample size of 25 is 4 gram the supposedly allowed standard deviation or not right so if 20 4 gram is across all the samples right all the all the population entire population in a given sample size of 25 samples would 4 gram be the actual standard deviation probably not the standard deviation should be somewhere around 4 by root over 25 which is 4 by 5 which is roughly around 1 point uh, which is around 4 by 5 is roughly around 0.8 right so actually the standard deviation that she should have seen should be somewhere around 0.8 gram in a sample size of 25 right and in a sample size of 25 she sees actually a standard deviation of 2 so now that that is the information okay so now this is an in class activity let's now kind of go through this a company uses a semi-automatic process to fill coffee powder in 200 gram jars and this fill is known to have standard deviation of 4 gram fair enough for long the amount of coffee powder filled is observed to be normally distributed with a mean of 200 grams uh, the manager is concerned with ensuring that the process is working satisfactorily so that the average amount of coffee powder filled in jars is 200 gram so she is basically this kind of operational quality insurance kind of a manager she has this she knows that the coffee jars need to be exactly 200 grams and she knows that the entire population over the entire population the standard deviation is somewhere around 4 grams right so now she wants to ensure that it's actually being followed in real life or not right so what she does is she takes a sample of 25 jars and based on that he coffee amount in the each of them he measures out the average amount to be around 200 grams right 202 grams right so now our problem is how is strong how relevant is this difference of 2 gram right and that is the whole point of calculating the p-value you remember p-value is basically so she sees obviously 202 gram is greater than 200 grams so now her only concern is okay i see that it for this particular sample of 25 samples that i have chosen that it is greater than 200 grams now does this observing this on 25 samples does it kind of automatically imply that for all my entire population is it greater than 200 grams right so is the entire population mean like not every coffee bar jar is probably actually getting filled with more coffee than it should be so that's our concern right so basically her concern is the statistical uh, inference that she has drawn how reliable is that based on the sample right reliability of the sampling that she has done that's exactly the concern right and we have talked about that that's exactly what your p-value measures right your p-value is basically measuring how extreme your sample is right so before going into the entire calculation let's try and guess by ourselves whether it's actually a significant difference or not so we know that 200 gram is a mean and four standard deviation is what is the standard deviation from the mean that is allowed right so now by that logic we see that obviously 200 plus minus 4 which is 196 to 204 should be allowed right but now remember this the 4 gram standard deviation is on the entire population right so on the entire population if the standard deviation is 4 gram on a sample size of 25 the population deviation should be the study the standard deviation should be 4 by root of 25 which is 4 by 5 which is roughly around 0.8 right so ideally in a sample of 25 jars 25 sample in a in a sample of 25 uh, jars uh, the manager should not have seen standard deviation or should have seen a standard deviation of roughly 0.8 right so she should have just seen the variation lying between 200 minus 0 0.8 which is 199.2 199.2 to 200.8 right so the value should have lied within those range so clearly in this case it's way above that right so two it's way above 0 0.8 right so it's the deviation is 2 grams so 202 is definitely greater than uh, the deviation she should have seen so that probably means that there's a significant difference which probably means that based on this sample yeah i think uh, coffee jars are actually someone is actually filling out all the coffee jars to the full they're definitely putting more coffee than they should have profitable for customers definitely but now let's do this entire thing calculation right and understand the same concept intuitive now that was intuitive understanding let's just understand this now in a thorough theoretical way so your null hypothesis is h naught which is mu equals to 2 gram 
your null hypothesis alternative hypothesis is a it's probably not equals to 200 to gram, 200 grams right so we now know population mean is 200 standard deviation sigma is 4 your sample mean is x bar 202 and your sample size is 25 right so you calculate your test statistics which is nothing but your z score and based on the z score you see that the value comes out to be 2.5 right so basically z score basically says that this test the sample that you have observed the mean that you have observed which is 202 is actually 2.5 standard deviations above than the actual value that should have been there right so your actual value should have been 0.8 that's the maximum you should have done that's one standard deviation 0.8 right so this value 202 is actually 2.5 times that so 2.5 into 0.8 is 2 right so that's exactly what this statistic is saying that what you're observing is actually 2.5 standard deviations away from your uh, ideal value that should have been there and obviously as you know if you remember your uh, last lecture we have seen that 2.2 standard deviation is actually a whole lot right your 95 percent of your standard 95 percent of the population basically lies within within two standard deviations almost so 2.5 is actually a high number so based on that if you have your z score if your alpha is 0 0.05 right which is uh, five percent significance level 0 0.05 so from that you can basically calculate that the z score of alpha you can say that hey i think that is a very high value so that means that uh, the this the null hypothesis this sample that you have chosen is an extreme sample to support your null hypothesis right for a null hypothesis to be true this is, has to be an extreme sample right uh, with a value which is the probability of which is extremely lower than 0 0.05 so in that case we can probably we can say that this is definitely the case that uh, in this kind of a case we can definitely conclude that the null hypothesis is not true right so this is exactly what we have done here again so we have enough evidence uh, against the null hypothesis and hence we can conclude that the difference of two grams is a significant difference right so to support our null hypothesis the values should have been between roughly say 200.3 200.4 the values should have been fine 200.8 is one standard deviation move right that would have also been fine but this is 2.5 times the standard deviation right from the mean so that probably says there's a significant difference uh she so to support her null hypothesis of the values being equal this is an extremely rare prob sample right so that definitely means we cannot accept the null hypothesis so we have to reject this so now let's look at the next example to understand this even more clearly a company manufacturing automotive automobile tires finds that tire life is normally distributed with a mean of 40,000 kilometers and standard deviation of 3,000 kilometers it is believed that a change in production process will result in a better product and the company has developed a new tire a sample of 100 new tires has been selected so now the company basically is kind of trying to uh, develop new kind of tires and what it does is basically obviously it cannot test out the entire new tires all of them right so obviously what you do is very simple you take out some sample of 100 tires and company found that the mean life of those new tires is 40,900 kilometers can it be concluded that the new tires are significantly better than the old one using alpha equals to 0 0.05 again let's try and understand this so earlier the 40,000 was basically your mean and 3,000 was basically the standard deviation so it could vary between one standard deviation move would be basically between 37,000 to 43,000 right and now but that is on an entire population on a sample of 100 tires the the sigma would be basically be not anymore be 3,000 kilometers but would be basically 3,000 sigma by root n root n is 10 so 3,000 by 10 which is around 300 kilometers so 40,000 plus minus 300 kilometers in this case again we see that the standard the value that we have is 40,900 kilometers so which is three times the standard deviation moves so this is three times standard deviation ahead of your expected value expected values so expected standard deviation is 300 kilometers right so 40,000 plus minus 300 kilometers is like fine within one standard deviation this is not within one standard this is within three standard deviation moves right so that definitely says that hey if, if it's that high that probably says that the new tires are probably absolutely fantastic right because that says that 
yeah the null hypothesis that they are similar you cannot really say that right because now 900 kilometers is a significant difference we know already that 300 kilometers is one standard deviation move expected from the expected mean right now 900 kilometers move is probably that probably means that these are actually significantly better than your old tires now let's again do the same thing so your first null hypothesis is mu equals to 40,000 your population and you do the entire thing you calculate your standard deviation it comes out to be as I said 3 now for 3 again you see the alpha value is 1.6 I'll calculate the test the test statistics is higher than the z squared of alpha so that we mean again we have enough evidence against null hypothesis right so he, he, we can conclude that the new tire is significantly better so we can arrive at the same calculation you can do the zero p value calculation it would come out to be 0 0.0014 right so obviously as calculated the p value is less than alpha so that we can conclude that our sample gives enough evidence against the null hypothesis and hence we can conclude that a new tire is significantly better right so this concept is very clear to you right so at every step we are gonna basically take the test statistic and calculate the z's so one thing to keep in mind is it's not always that you calculate z's code you could be using something else as well and we will be talking about that in a little bit uh, the test statistic could be depending on the kind of test that you're doing what we did was simple z test so in z test you basically calculate the z score and based on the z score you see if the corresponding c from the cdf table if the the corresponding uh, CDF value for that corresponding Z score and if that Z score corresponding CDF value is basically much lower than in this case the CDF value comes out to be 0 0.0014 which is less than your significance value and hence you say that we reject the test right your significance value was 0 0.005 right 0 0.05 which is 5% and in this case the error comes the P value comes out to be 0.14 right so 0.1% so obviously which is 0.1 percent is less than 5 percent hence you reject the null hypothesis right the same thing you had done earlier here also in this case you calculated the, the z score and the z score came out to be 0 0.0062 which is much lower than 0 0.05 right which is a significance level so as it is lower than zero significance score you basically say that the null hypothesis is not correct right so this is the understanding you calculate z score you calculate the corresponding from that z score you calculate the cdf value by looking up that table or you can use python you don't need to do that like the way i did it in school uh, you can just use python code and get the corresponding cdf value for that z score and from that cdf score you see that if that value is less than 0 0.05 or not depending 0 0.05 being your significance level you could have some other significance if you want to go for as we said talked about the convict example you could have a very low significance level you could have a very high significance a high significance level would basically mean actually a lower 0 0.001 kind of a thing right and so that's the idea but based on whatever significance level you want to go ahead with you say that this is my significance level and on this significance level i see that the z score is basically the cdf value is lower than the z score lower than the significance value and hence we have to reject the null hypothesis so the same example in both the cases now let's go back to his example the one that john was doing and how different is the prices so to do that what we do is we check all the prices in uh, in the neighborhood of old town and we check all the prices in uh, brooklyn right yeah so yeah we basically check for the, all the prices of house prices in old town and we want to see how different are they different from house prices in brooklyn or not so to do that we basically for obviously for almost all of the things that you do you really do not know need to kind of do a lot of uh, the whole thing that we talked about hypothesis testing that whole hype uh, you know calculating the z statistic looking up the cdf value all of those you do not need to do anymore in today's world you can directly use code as it is so for that you basically all you need to do is first initialize the z test and then pass the two data points right so the first value is your is all the all the old town all the values of sales price in all the in the neighborhood old town and then the second value is the old town the mean of the old town right and from that you basically calculate the z statistic which is minus 10 which is a huge 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 value right so obviously you say that the the p value is extremely extremely low so that means you have to reject null hypothesis right so that means that if you reject null hypothesis that means that 
prices in old town are very very different from your uh, house prices in brooklyn right that's what your p value says p value is extremely low you see 10 to the power minus 26 obviously the z statistics you can see is minus 10 right so this is minus 10 so this is prices in brooklyn are minus 10 standard deviations away from the overall population prices right which means that prices in brooklyn are extremely cheap right it's 10 standard deviations away right uh, so 10 standard deviation away basically always would give you a very low p value right so that means already we saw three standard deviation was a significant difference 10 standard deviation is extremely high so you have a p value which is extremely low which means that your null hypothesis that the prices are same has to be rejected your prices are extremely different right and we know that by from the z statistic we know that the prices actually are cheaper right because the z statistic is negative so summary of the p value we have already talked about performing hypothesis test p value is the probability of a given or more extreme outcome being uh, so the null hypothesis that you're trying to support what is the probability of the sample that you have chosen uh, being an extreme example right for the hypothesis that you're trying to prove for your null hypothesis right so the, when we see we see that the p value is close to zero that is the probability of getting the given distribution of house prices in old town under the assumption that its mean is same as the mean of house prices right so p value is basically the probability in this particular example is a probability of getting the given distribution of house prices of old town under the assumption that the means are equal right so what is the probability that i will actually end up the sample that i've chosen what is the probability that the house prices are actually same and i would still have the sample that i have right so what is the probability that the sample that i've chosen is actually a valid sample under the assumption that the prices are same right so the probability is extremely low right because from this sample you can see it's 10 standard deviations away from the actual price so that happening so probability of that happening is extremely extremely low right even if your real world prices are actually equal the sample that you have chosen is so deviated the probability of that is extremely low right so that's why we have got p-value so what can we infer from the p-value is that if the value is basically much lower say less than 0 0.05 that's a, again 0 0.05 is a significance level you choose ideally uh, normally 0 0.05 or a 0 0.001 kind of a thing uh, if your p-value is less than 0 0.05 you reject the null hypothesis and accept your alternative hypothesis right on the other hand, if your p-value is actually high, you say we cannot reject the null hypothesis, we have to accept null hypothesis, right? So it's very, very clear, right? P-value is the probability of the sample that you have chosen that under the assumption that your null hypothesis is true. So in this particular example, the null hypothesis was prices in Brooklyn are same as prices in rest of the country, rest of the city. Under that assumption, we see that what is the probability that the sample we have chosen is a valid sample, right? So the probability of that is actually very low, right? Because from the sample, we see the prices are extremely different. So the prices are so different and and the sample is, you know, we still think that the sample is a valid. Probably if we take other samples, the prices would come out to be equal, right? So that's our underlying assumption. So, so thing like that would happening, the probability of that would be one ten to the power minus 26, right? So that means the sample, this is not an extreme sample uh this is an extreme sample for the null hypothesis right so we have got to reject null hypothesis so under the assumption of null hypothesis what is the probability that we could end up with the sample that we have actually ended up with so obviously now john also wants to see if houses prices in store brook neighborhood are different from prices of houses so now john is just going about doing the entire thing on different sets so he sees in this case the p-value is again significantly low right so he can again he has to conclude that the uh, prices in Stonebrook are different from the rest of the houses in Brooklyn, right? Log on to Grey Atoms Learning Platform to unlock more free content. Subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for regular updates.